Right now on Morning News Now, Israel is stepping up its aerial assault on southern Gaza, launching airstrikes that hit residential buildings in Rafah. Gazan health officials say dozens of Palestinians were killed. It comes after Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin urged Israeli officials to do more to protect civilians amid new condemnation of Israel over an attack on a church in Gaza. More on that as global calls for a ceasefire intensify. Also this morning, more than 100 people have been killed in an earthquake that hit northwestern China. Details of that country's deadliest quake in 13 years. And a new NBC News survey shows younger voters are turning their back on President Biden in favor of former President Trump. We'll find out what's behind the changing attitudes. Plus, delving across the final frontier, we'll look back at some of the biggest moments of the year for space travel and what the future may hold for exploring the great unknown. We do love space news here. We do so much so I feel like eventually we'll do a show from somewhere out there. Mm. Maybe I'll be here <laughs> Far and you'll be the remote anchor. <laughs> okay, we can do a dual anchor show. <laughs> Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to get started this morning with the latest on the U.S. efforts to find a pathway toward life after the war between Israel and Hamas. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin met with Israeli officials to discuss the ongoing bombings in Gaza. Despite growing tensions between the U.S. and Israel, Austin vowed to continue supporting Israel in its fight against Hamas. This is my fourth visit to Israel as Secretary of Defense and my second time since October 7th. And I know that Israel has been profoundly changed from where you were on October 6th. So I'm here with a clear message. America's support for Israel's security is unshakable. And Israel is not alone. Austin also stressed the importance of protecting the Palestinian people during this war and finding a solution that would provide stability to both sides once the fighting ends. This all comes as both the U.S. and Israel face mounting pressure to scale back attacks in the region. Officials with the Hamas-run health ministry in Gaza say nearly 20,000 people have been killed. At least half of the population there is now facing starvation. NBC News correspondent Hala Garani joins us now from Tel Aviv with the very latest. Hala, good morning. So Secretary Austin took part in this joint news conference yesterday with his Israeli counterpart. It was there. Israel's defense minister said the military is preparing for a gradual transition to the next phase of this war. Walk us through what that could look like, especially for those who are living in Gaza. Well, the Secretary of Defense mentioned it was his second visit to Israel since October 7th. And really, if you peel back all the layers of Diplo speak here from Lloyd Austin, the primary goal appears to be to have discussions, serious discussions, about how to move from a high-intensity phase of this war that is causing thousands and thousands of civilian deaths inside of the Gaza Strip to a more surgical operation. Surgical is the term uh, that was used during that news conference. Conference. And uh, Secretary Austin's counterpart, Yoav Golan, was also asked about the Israeli military's willingness and its planning for moving on to the next phase of this conflict. This is what he had to say. Listen. We will be able to uh, transition gradually uh, to the next phase and start working uh, on bringing back local population. That means that it can be achieved maybe sooner in the north rather than in the south. So we are dealing with all the different components and we will decide in the next, uh, in the next future, the early future. Oh, well, the big question, Joe, is, of course, moving the population back to the north. What are they moving back to? By some accounts, over half of the residential buildings have been destroyed. Ahala, we also referenced a moment ago what happened at this church in Gaza. The White House has expressed new concerns over a mother and daughter that were killed while sheltering there. Explain what happened and is this yeah. latest attack fueling more frustration with Israel? So we're talking about the last 
Catholic Church in Gaza. I remember years ago doing a story on the Christian population inside of the Gaza Strip, and even then there were only numbered in the couple of thousand. It's really a handful of Christian Gazans left. And according to the uh, uh, Catholic uh, patriarch in uh, Jerusalem, or I should say the Latin patriarch in Jerusalem, this is a mother and daughter who were killed, Nahida and Samar Anton. One was shot while carrying the other to safety inside of the courtyard of that Catholic church. Now, the IDF is denying, the Israeli military is denying that this happened, saying that there was no fighting in the area, but this has caused consternation inside of Gaza's tiny little Christian community and beyond. And Hala, a new Human Rights Watch report says the Israeli government is using starvation in Gaza as a method of warfare. Comes as the humanitarian crisis, as we've reported, continues to worsen. What are you hearing on the ground about how dire the situation there is getting? Well, we spoke to the head of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency on the ground, Tom White, just about a, a few hours ago. Uh, and he talked about using the um, blockade of Gaza, about using, uh, about uh, keeping uh, water and, and food and using the uh, uh, sort of the limitation of the entry of that humanitarian aid as a weapon of war. But also some of the things, Joe and Savannah, people rarely think about. So for instance, we've been covering the injuries. We've been covering the deaths a lot. But for instance, having 10,000 people in a school sheltering in a school that is designed to accommodate a thousand people is putting untold pressure on the infrastructure of Gaza. And Tom White, we asked him specifically about what it's like living as an internally displaced person inside a UN run school. And this is how he described some of what daily life is like to us. Take a listen. And you know, there, there was literally feces and urine flowing out of the bathrooms into the schoolyard because the sewerage system just cannot cope. Um, that was flowing into yeah. the schoolyard where people have built their makeshift shelters. And the, the, the stench was such that it was not just that you could smell the sewerage, you could taste the sewerage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and people are living in that 24 hours a day. Well, so as uh, high-level officials discuss uh, the post-war situation for Gaza, it, you know, it's important to keep in mind that the infrastructure is demolished and there are very few places for, for, for anyone left to go back to once the bombs stop falling. Back to you. All right. Hala Garani, thank you very much. Israeli officials say the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah has increased its attacks on Israel since the war against Hamas started. Now concerns are mounting that the war could spread even farther. NBC News Now anchor Hallie Jackson is in Tel Aviv with that part of the story. New Israeli airstrikes in Lebanon aimed at Hezbollah in footage released by the IDF as both sides trade fire. Roughly 2,000 rockets believed to have crisscrossed the border since October 7th. Reportedly, four Israeli civilians killed and more than 30 Lebanese. In northern Israel, the fear war could come here. Ariel Frisch says it already is. We have every day here shooting missiles. We meet Frisch in Kiryat Shimona, a town so close to Lebanon, just over the ridge. He says people don't run to a shelter outside if sirens go off. There's no time. We hear IDF rockets nearby. Kiatrona was the first to get well, this is our bombs. This is our rockets. And later? Tell me about living here. What's it normally like? hear it again. On, on regular times, you hear only birds here. In regular times, about 23,000 people live here. They've been evacuated, with stores gated up. The playground's deserted. Frisch takes us to the school where there are no students. As you can see. Just an empty office, his own. He's the principal here, trying to keep track of the kids now scattered across dozens of other towns. We have our troops instead of, instead of uh, students. Shouldn't be this, this way. Shouldn't be. In the center of town, we see what's left of this burger shop destroyed. But a couple doors down, soldiers fill the tables outside another restaurant. It belongs to Shalomi Apupo, who stayed in town, he tells us, to sell kebabs to hungry troops. Where I go? I need to stay here to give food to the soldiers. Clearly, not everyone has left. What do you hope for the future for your town? Just peace. 
prosperity, keeping the Hezbollah away. October 7th haunts them here. If Hamas could attack there, what's next? You're worried, it sounds like, that what happened down in the south could happen in the north. No, it will definitely happen. If we will not fight and strike first, it will happen. Our thanks to Hallie Jackson for that report. Now to Washington, where time is running out for the Senate to strike a deal on immigration, along with extending aid for Israel and Ukraine before the end of the year. The Senate leaders say some progress has been made, but nothing's done yet. Negotiators have been meeting with White House officials and Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. A deal concerning the crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border is a major sticking point for House Republicans. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is urging negotiators to keep going. Everyone knows that something should be done to fix our broken immigration system. But we can't do so by compromising our values. Finding the middle ground is exceptionally hard. And both sides must accept that they will have to make concessions. And it's going to take some more time to get it done. For the latest, let's bring in NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitali. Ali, good morning. So we know the Senate has actually postponed its holiday recess to try to deal with these negotiations. It's unclear how many more days the Senate will actually be in session this week. So tell us, where do negotiations stand right now? Is it possible, do we think, for the Senate to vote on a deal here before Christmas? Look, with every passing day, Savannah, it gets even harder to imagine a scenario where the Senate not only cobbles together a bipartisan compromise on these really thorny issues, because remember, it's not just immigration, it's also supplemental funding to countries like Israel and Ukraine, but also then cobbling together that deal with enough time to vote for it. We knew this was going to be a scramble to the finish line, but the idea that there are only 60 plus senators in town, it's an extremely small number that we saw show up for votes yesterday. It may indicate the level of confidence or even the level of will to actually stay in town and allow negotiators the time and space to continue working while also just waiting for the possibility that a vote could happen. That's what Senator Chris Coons is saying everyone is weighing. Watch. We should reach a conclusion either uh, that it's important for us to stay here and keep confirming nominees and keep the pressure on for this team to uh, finish their work or to recognize that it's going to take more than the next couple of days. And the best way for us to support them in that work is to go home and give them more than a week. And so the reality is, while the Senate is doing that balancing act that Senator Coons is talking about, the House would also have to come back to pass this, as you know, Savannah. And our understanding, based on Speaker Mike Johnson and other Republicans I've talked to, is that they don't really feel the pressure to come back to town and vote for this. And so it does leave us sort of at a stalemate as we wait to see what these negotiations produce. So, Ali, among the many sticking points, we know Republicans want to give the president more executive powers to crack down on the border to try and control mm -hmm. the number of migrants seeking asylum. But two sources with knowledge of the talk say Democrats are exploring ways to prevent a future president from abusing any potential powers like that. What more can you tell us about that? I think the short and clear way of saying this, Joe, is that Democrats are trying to Trump proof this because while there is an agreement, as Senator Schumer said, that something needs to be done to better secure the southern border and deal with this influx of immigration. At the same time, a lot of Democrats are skittish about some of the things that are actually on the table, things like putting it, make it easier to turn folks around at the southern border or limiting asylum numbers within this country. All of those things that are on the table make Democrats, especially Hispanic group and Hispanic advocates and Democrats themselves very nervous about where these negotiations are, less so because of the Biden administration and more so because of the possibility of a Trump administration on the horizon. They're trying to make sure that if this package passes, Trump can not abuse it if he's elected later on. Ali, very quickly, if this does not get done before the end of the year, what does this mean for January? Oh, it looks really, really tough because January already is going to be a big funding fight. You'll remember just a few weeks ago, House Republicans made it so there's not just one, but there's two debt ceiling crises looming as a government shutdown could happen in phases as opposed to wholesale. Republicans and Democrats alike are going to have to deal with that. On top of it, putting this supplemental makes a sticky situation even stickier. Ali Vitali, as always, thank you so much.
Well, Hunter Biden is now set to be arraigned on tax charges next month. New court documents show the president's son is expected to enter a plea on January 11th in federal court in Los Angeles. Biden faces nine tax-related charges, including three felony and six misdemeanor offenses. If convicted, the maximum penalty he could face is 17 years in prison. Hunter Biden's attorney has alleged the case is politically motivated. Well, a Delaware man is facing drunk driving charges this morning after police say he plowed his car into President Biden's motorcade over the weekend. Wilmington police are calling it an accidental collision. President Biden was walking from his campaign office to a waiting armored SUV on Sunday night. That's when a car hit a Secret Service vehicle that was being used to seal off the area. The president and the first lady who was with him were not injured. NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli joins us with more on this. Mike, good morning. So we mentioned those drunk driving charges. Just tell us what we know now about what happened. Well, Joe, what you had happen here was because this was what we call an unscheduled or OTR uh, stop here at the president's campaign headquarters here in Wilmington, you had a smaller than expected than usual motorcade and you had it snaked around a public park right in the heart of downtown Wilmington. There are police vehicles at each intersection to make sure that no other vehicles unauthorized can get in. Well, what happened was the real classic case of the absolute wrong place at the absolute wrong time. This individual drove a car into one of those SUVs that was trying to block one of these intersections. And it happened just as the president, as you see, was coming out of that campaign headquarters. It's unusual to have this happen, concerning to have this happen, but especially jarring to see exactly the way this unfolded. Now, the Wilmington police, as you say, initially suspected impairment, did eventually charge this man with drunk driving and inattentive driving. You also had the Secret Service issue a statement saying that there were no protective interests involved here. That's a, an, another way of saying that they quickly determined that there was no threat to the president here. Mike, let's rewind to before this incident, this drunk driving accident. Uh, what was this meeting about? Tell us about this gathering with campaign staff. Well, this was just uh, the president making a visit to his campaign headquarters here for the very first time in 2020. The campaign's headquarters was in Philadelphia, but I'm told the president insisted this time around that just like most of his campaigns throughout his career, that this one be based in his hometown. So while he was in town for the weekend, he stopped by the campaign headquarters where it's filling up fast with staff ahead of 2024. He had dinner along with the first lady and the team. And we know what was probably something that came up, the concerning polls that Democrats are really worried about. A new one out today showing Donald Trump leading President Biden by two points among registered voters. You have President Biden, though, leading Trump by two points among likely voters in the New York Times Siena poll. The president, when he was asked why he's trailing Trump in some of these polls, he said, you're looking at the wrong polls. Mike, while we have you, let's talk to you about what we've been talking about for the last 17 minutes or so, and that is, you know, multi-billion dollar aid package to Israel and Ukraine, which is tied up with the deal on the southern border. We're seeing progress, but still no deal. For President Biden, what's at stake here as he tries to hammer out a deal? Well, think of it this way, Joe. As we end 2023, one of the things that President Biden has said he is most proud of is leading the world, rallying our allies to support Ukraine in its fight against Russia. Well, that very issue, the future of that aid, is being held up by what has been probably the most difficult domestic political issue since he took office, and that is, of course, the situation at the border. And so that's why there are some advocates on the left concerned that the president is so desperate, in their words, to get this Ukraine aid that he's willing to make a number of compromises on the border uh, that he would not otherwise do. The White House issuing yet another alarm yesterday saying that without congressional action, they are down to their last what they call drawdown authority, the ability to provide Ukraine with some more aid without replacing that aid in our own stockpile. The president trying to get this done by the end of the year, but that looks, as Ali just laid out, very unlikely. All right, Mike Memoli, Mike, thank you so much. Speaking of President Biden, young voters were an essential part of the coalition that helped him get into the White House back in 2020. But tides could be turning for the president. A recent NBC News survey found former President Donald Trump is beating President Biden with voters age 18 to 34. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster spoke with some young Biden supporters about how they're going to be voting in 2024. I voted for Biden, and I told my friends to as well. Evan McKenzie is a Starbucks worker and union organizer in Madison, Wisconsin, who cast his very first presidential ballot for Joe Biden. Do you plan on voting for him this time around? Uh, no, no, not, not anymore. The 23-year-old was part of the surge in young voters in the liberal Dane County that helped Biden flip the battleground state three years ago. He's now angry at the president over his support for Israel's invasion of Gaza. 
he is allowing this war to happen and, and is funding this war. I don't know what will happen if I don't vote for him, but I know it won't be me supporting that. In 2020, Election Day exit polls showed young voters backed Biden over Donald Trump by more than 20 points. But a recent NBC News poll shows former President Trump leading this group by four percentage points and President Biden at risk of losing a key part of his winning coalition. Do you plan on voting for him in November? I don't know. 60% of young voters say they oppose more funding and military aid to Israel. On climate, uh, on COVID responses, you could tell he, his and his administration were doing uh, really great work. But I think after October 7th, the question became a matter of, of human rights. Republican presidential candidates have also vocally supported Israel's campaign against Hamas. But it's President Biden's young progressive base that's been increasingly sympathetic to Palestinians. Did all of you vote for Biden in 2020? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Supporting Mr. Biden is a conversation, sometimes a debate, that this group of Wisconsin friends say they are now having regularly. He has the lar largest infrastructure bill since Eisenhower. I mean, that's a huge thing. Not, not enthused. Uh, I'd say overall I feel very pragmatic and strategic about it. In 2020, I looked at Biden like a used car. Like, it will disappoint me. It's not going to have leather seats, and it's not going to have all the stuff that I want. But, I mean, hopefully it'll get me from point A to point B. And I think he did that. An easy choice for some. What's the best argument that you have for young voters to support Joe Biden? The other guy is way worse. <laughs> it's that simple. I, I think it is. Young voters who can tip the balance in 2024 already weighing their options. Shaquille Brewster, NBC News, Madison, Wisconsin. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, apparently somewhere, not here. <laughs> Snow is falling, though, across parts of the Great Lakes. Will it ever look like that again <laughs> here, Angie Lassman? Well, you know, unfortunately, not to go off on a tangent, but Christmas <laughs> week looks very warm across the country, guys. So if you're looking for a white Christmas, you might have to, I don't know, look ahead to next year. But either way, we do have a little bit of snow falling along the Great Lakes. We've got that lake effect snow going after that system exited. It left us with some blustery kind of winds and chilly winds at that. So we do have those uh, winter alerts up for that region. We'll slow Slowly but surely start to see that snow tapering off here as we get through the day today, but not af until after we get maybe a half a foot or up to a foot uh, in those areas. But look ahead to the later parts of today and all of that kind of tapers off. But we will be left with the chilly conditions across really most of the east. That's where the cool air is in place. And we still actually have some of these um, freeze warnings in place for parts of Georgia and Florida. And we've got some freeze watches along the coast of the Big Bend area in Florida as well with these temperatures this morning sitting anywhere from the low 30s in Augusta and make into the upper 30s for Valdosta and a couple of spots sitting into the low 40s. So maybe some frost out there on your cars as you head out the door. A very different story, though, if you look to the middle of the country, 67 degrees in Denver this afternoon. That number is well above normal for this time of year. We're running more than 20 degrees above normal in a lot of spots. Rapid City, Denver, 16 degrees above normal in Amarillo as they head to the mid 60s through the day today. And that warmth kind of spreads to the east as we get into tomorrow. This is what I was talking about with the wishing for a white Christmas because places like Chicago, 42 degrees, St. Louis into the upper 50s, Kansas City into the mid 50s, Oklahoma City will hit the low 60s tomorrow. And it's not too chilly even through the rest of the week as we kind of moderate out. We'll still end up into the low to mid 40s in Cleveland as we head into the weekend, upper 40s for uh, Saturday in Washington. In D.C. We'll actually get into the 30s on Friday in New York City, but kind of hang out into those low 40s um, as we roll into the upcoming weekend. One note, we do have kind of a busy forecast out west. We've got a couple of systems that are going to work uh, onshore and bring rain and snow. If you're, I guess if you're looking for a white Christmas, head over to uh, the Sierras, guys. We will have some significant snowfall there and a good amount of rain, too, for portions of California. It's like the forecast for like Halloween or something. It, feels <laughs> it like. did. Mid 60s, upper so 60s true. in Denver oh, today. It's weird. Right. Feels spooky. weird. So right. little spooky. Spooky. Thank right. spooky is exactly Thank right. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> Coming up, it is being described as China's deadliest earthquake in 13 years. Yeah, we'll cross over to Beijing for the latest on the natural disaster that's claimed more than 100 lives. Stay with us. That's next.
Welcome back. Former Trump lawyer Rudy Giuliani is facing a new lawsuit, this one from the same two former Georgia election workers who just won nearly $150 million from him in a defamation suit last week. In this new suit, Ruby Freeman and her daughter Shay Moss are asking a federal judge to permanently bar Giuliani from making further defamatory statements about them. NBC News Justice reporter Ryan Riley joins us now with the latest on this. Hey, Ryan, good morning. So this all stems from comments that were made by Giuliani immediately after last week's verdict, that $150 million one. Tell us exactly what Moss and Freeman want now from this new lawsuit. Yeah, essentially, they just want this to stop, right? Rudy Giuliani really couldn't seem to help himself last week. Every time he saw a camera, he was making some comments saying that his original comments were supportable. It wasn't quite as extreme as he was making the claims back in 2020. But he was saying what he said in 2020 was all true, and it's not. It's false. It's been adjudicated already by the court, but he still was continuing to make these claims. So basically, now they're seeking an injunction, just trying to make this end. They tried to reach an agreement with Rudy Giuliani directly, and he would not agree to stop making these claims against them. So they ended up bringing forth this litigation. So is Giuliani responding to this new lawsuit at all? You know, he hasn't. But if we listen to what he just what he had to say, he hasn't in substance, I should say. He said, you know, his statement, his uh, his spokesperson put out a statement saying that this is the same rate Rudy Giuliani who took down the mob, who was, you know, obviously the mayor during 9-11, et cetera. But nothing really in substance uh, to respond to the allegations because no one wants to get sucked into those muddy waters. Right. The spokesperson isn't going to say that, yes, these claims are true because the spokesperson knows those claims are false. And Rudy Giuliani just really can't seem to help himself every time he goes in front of the camera. Cameras. As we heard last week, uh, just take a listen. I told the truth. They they were engaged in changing votes. There's no proof of that. Oh, you're damn right there is. Stay tuned. You can see in the background the spokesperson there sort of trying to shuffle him off. Okay, Rudy, let's get in the car here, right? It's almost like he has a minder with him um, here, but he still just sort of goes off the rails and makes these claims that anyone, you know, capable of using some critical thinking skills realizes are not true. Ryan, immediately after yesterday's filing, the attorney for Moss and Freeman asked the judge to let them pursue this $140 million judgment from Giuliani. How does that work and how soon would they, could they begin receiving payment? Yeah, well, the problem is, is that Rudy Giuliani doesn't have a lot of assets at this point, and no one's really going to be hiring him, obviously, for um, his, his his legal skills, I suppose, because he's barred from practicing at the moment. Um, you know, he's uh, he so he has this he has a show uh, on a uh, I guess he has a one a program on a cable news uh, program. He has that radio show. Those are his income streams at this point. So I think that's probably what they're going to be going after here. But, you know, he doesn't it's not like he's sitting on a bunch of assets. He's selling his uh, his New York home. Um, and also there's a lien against his property uh, in Florida. So, you know, it is going to take a while, I think, for this process to play out. And obviously, Rudy Giuliani uh, uh, plans on appealing this verdict. Um, so this will be Go, this will be something that will be going on for a while. Mm. Right. Ryan Riley. Ryan, thank you. Thank you. Well, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor is set to be laid to rest today in Washington. Funeral services are scheduled to be held at Washington National Cathedral. Yesterday, the nine current justices, along with retired Justice Anthony M. Kennedy, gathered with O'Connor's former law clerks and family for a private service. O'Connor's casket then lay in repose in the Supreme Court's Great Hall for the public to pay their respects. Justice O'Connor was the first woman on the Supreme Court, nominated in 1981 by President Ronald Reagan. She died of complications from dementia earlier this month at the age of 93. Happening now, rescue efforts are underway in northwestern China after a powerful and deadly earthquake. This morning, at least 118 people are dead from the 5.9 magnitude quake. It struck a remote province yesterday. Officials there say electricity, water, and transportation infrastructure are now damaged, along with thousands of houses. All this is the mountainous region deals with extremely frigid temperatures. Joining us now from Beijing is NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Freyer. Janice, on top of all that, people in the area are dealing with the aftershocks. What's the latest you're hearing? Well, rescue teams have been working through the night and 
all day today in freezing cold temperatures, trying to find survivors in the rubble. There are nearly 2,000 firefighters who are at the epicenter right now. They are also setting up temporary shelters. But officials are asking people, warning people who want to volunteer to help out to stay away from the area because there are still aftershocks. The initial quake struck around midnight. The tremors were felt for 20 seconds. They were felt hundreds of miles away, according to state media. And at 10 o'clock this morning, there were still aftershocks, one of them measuring magnitude 4.1. So officials are saying it's still a very volatile area, a dangerous area. They have more rescue teams on standby if need be. Janice, let's talk more about the temperatures. Negative four degrees at the epicenter when this earthquake hit, according to state media. How has the cold made it even more challenging for rescue workers? Well, it, it happened in a part of China where earthquakes are not uncommon, but this quake is uh, on course to be one of the deadliest in the past decade. Uh, what has been complicating efforts is the fact that it's just so cold. Uh, much of northern China has been caught up in a cold wave. We're feeling it here in Beijing. In that area, it's remote, it's mountainous. Electricity and water infrastructure have also been affected. Uh, rescue officials are saying the first 72 hours after an earthquake are the most critical, and the fact that it's so bitterly cold is hampering those efforts. Video showed people rushing out of their homes when the quake happened and into the bitter cold night, huddling in the darkness. So it's, it's a complicated effort, not only to try to dig through the rubble, but also provide warmth and safety uh, for the people who made it out. And on top of everything else, this is also one of China's poorest provinces, home to about 260,000 people. How is that impacting everything right now? Well, this is a this is at the edge of the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau. It's it's mountainous, it's remote, uh, and rural. The housing construction uh, is uh, more basic compared to other parts of the country. This is also a poor part of the country, uh, so houses just aren't built to sustain this kind of earthquake. China's earthquake administration uh, said that the quake was shallow and it was strong. They measured it at magnitude 6.2. The initial USGS assessment puts it at magnitude 5.9. Uh, China's government, Xi Jinping himself, has uh, ordered an all-out search and rescue effort. Uh, money is being deployed. Equipment is being deployed. Uh, again, the focus is to try to find survivors, get others to safety and to warmth, because the worry, of course, is that the toll of this quake is going to rise. Joe? All right. Janice Mackie Freyer. Janice, thank you so much. Coming up, shifting attitudes. The Pope has given the green light for priests to bless same-sex couples. Details of that landmark decision from the very top of the Catholic Church. That's next. We are back with a monumental moment at the Vatican. Pope Francis has given his approval for Catholic priests to now bless same-sex couples in a landmark shift for the church. Here's NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter with more. A radical step of inclusion, Pope Francis giving his permission for Catholic priests to bless same-sex couples. A change of perception, if not doctrine, and reflective of Francis's own more pastoral vision. Pope Francis deals in big picture, broad brush. He sends a broad message. The new declaration is a landmark step signaling the church's welcoming of the LGBTQ community. But the document signed by Pope Francis stresses that the blessing of same-sex couples is not the same as a marriage sacrament in the eyes of the church. I'm sure many people won't be satisfied with this. They would think that it's, uh, it's uh, anything short of marriage, anything short of equality is offensive. And on the other hand, some people will see this as an incremental step. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops said in a statement, each of us needs God's healing love and mercy in our lives. It's an overdue decision, but I'm glad that it's been made. And I think that's a great step forward. I think that's wonderful news, to be honest. Long overdue. You know, if Jesus said love was love, then love is love, isn't it? The door now open for so many who have not always felt welcome 
thanks to an aging pope still sparking controversial discussions. I think it will be taken as a step toward eventually allowing marriage. That's not what the Vatican is saying, but that's truly the way it will be perceived by many people. Molly Hunter, NBC News. Time now for our weekly mental health check-in, and today we're taking a closer look at what makes our emotions contagious. That's right, plus how racism could be impacting your mental health in a major way. We will explain, and we'll also tell you what you can do to protect yourself. Let's bring in Dr. Erica Richards to help break down these headlines and more. She is the chair of psychiatry at Sibley Memorial Hospital and an assistant professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins Medicine. Dr. Richards, always good to have you with us. So let's start with those contagious emotions. Walk us through mm -hmm. how this works. What social cues are we giving off that might impact moods? Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Savannah. So, you know, this is funny. We, we did a story together months ago about smiling mm. and how smiling can lift our own moods, and we all went out and tried it. Well, this is a similar concept. And psychologists have shown that when people interact, there's a lot of mimicry that goes on from body language to speech to rate to facial expressions. And then what happens, especially when we're with people that we care about or we like, we start to internalize the emotions that we see and the emotions that they're displaying, and that becomes similar to those emotions that we display ourselves. And so it's really important for us to understand that it does go both ways. Sometimes people are having a bad mood or a bad experience. We can internalize that as well. And so really gives us a reason that we go out and we want to spread joy, obviously, especially during this season. Mm, absolutely. I want to ask about this other one that we just mentioned a moment ago, a new three-part study in the Lancet Psychiatry Journal. It outlined the impact of racism on our mental health. A major takeaway really is that mental health care is not inclusive for black people. What steps does this report suggest we need to take as a society to try to write that? And what happens if we don't? And that's exactly what this three-part series is talking about. What can we do? What do mental health professionals need to do? What does society need to do? And it starts with acknowledging it. It starts with having these types of discussions to say, mental health care in general is not created equal. We've seen this with education. We've seen this with housing. We've seen this with income and health in general. And now I'm very happy that these authors have honed in on what should be different. And there are a lot of things that they say that we can change, but the number one thing that they're identifying is essentially the need for black representation and mental health. And in 2020, my colleagues at Hopkins and I published a similar study about the need for minority members of the mental health community. And that is one of the biggest things. So one of the reasons we are out with mentorship and recruitment is that people do want culturally sensitive care. And this gives even more credence to the fact that it is really important for us mm. to provide this care to get people better. So important to keep talking about this and grateful for the work you're doing with this issue. Another thing to talk about this morning, it's a new mental health therapy technique that's gaining popularity. It's called EFT, which means emotional freedom technique. I guess it involves tapping pressure points on the body. Tell us about this. How does it help? What are some of the benefits? Mm -hmm. So Joe, this is a type of mental health therapy. We talk a lot about different therapies that are used for specific reasons. And this, exactly what you said, it's tapping key points of the body, similar to acupressure, which many people have talked about. Now this can be done independently, or it can be done with the help of mental health professionals, depending on your diagnosis. And I think the important thing is to highlight what this can help with. It reduces stress and anxiety. Uh, it's been shown to lower biological levels, for example, cortisol in the body. It decreases physiological symptoms. So for some people, it can lower their blood pressure. And I think most importantly, another feature is that it can boost focus. It can decrease performance anxiety. So you'll see a lot of people doing this before they have big talks, before they go into negotiations or meetings. And the point is, once you go through, and, and, and in the health magazine, they're highlighting, here's how you do this step by step. Once you try to go through with that, a lot of people are getting benefit. Now, the, the jury's still out, and there's a lot of research that still has to be done for us to fully understand 
why this works, why this might work for some mm -hmm. populations and not others. But in general, we're really happy that we can add one more tool to that box for, for treatment of mental oh. health issues. Wish we had time cool. for a yeah, demo. Okay. <laughs> Where are the points, doctor? <laughs> we'll, we'll have to do a whole in-depth yeah. uh, dive yeah. into this coming up. Maybe after the holidays, we're yeah. really going to need it. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Erica Richards, is always good to have you on. Thanks for joining us this Thank morning. You. Coming up from shopping spree to crime spree. Retailers are blaming so-called organized retail crime for taking a chunk out of their profit. Profits. But could there be more to this story following a recent surge in smash and grabs? We've got more details on that up next. Welcome back. You've seen the videos of the violent smash and grab robberies carried out by huge mobs of shoplifters. Retailers call it organized retail crime and say it's responsible for a large chunk of lost revenue. But some experts say that may not be the case. NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans takes a closer look. You've seen the videos. The thieves can swipe tens of thousands of dollars of merchandise. They smashed glass display cases, filled their bags with jewelry, then took off. Smashing an SUV into the building, then making off with a still undetermined amount of merchandise. Smash and grabs getting a ton of airtime that the industry blames on a rise in so-called organized retail crime. Multiple people coming in to rob a store to steal goods that they turn around and sell often on online marketplaces. That might not be the whole story. It seems to be a term devised by the retail industry. It's not a legally defined crime. So it's a little bit in the eye of the beholder. But retail heads say they've had to close some stores because of it. Earlier this year, the National Retail Federation put out a report saying organized retail crime is responsible for nearly half of the $94.5 billion estimated in inventory loss in 2021, up from $61.7 billion in 2019. And it asked Congress to broaden the definition of organized crime to encompass retail theft, which would raise the possible penalties for stealing products. But in November, the NRF retracted that claim, saying those numbers were based on mistakes mistaken data stemming from this 2021 testimony. Organized retail crime represents a massive and growing threat to the tune of $45 billion a year. Dugan did not respond to a request for comment, but in a statement to NBC News, the NRF acknowledged the retraction, but said it stood behind the claim that organized retail crime is a serious problem. Economist Trevor Wegener was one of the first to say the numbers don't add up. And it boiled down to the claim that half of all retail inventory shrank came from organized retail crime. Uh, which did not pass a sanity check internally. He says that while organized retail crime is very much a real issue, it's likely responsible for a much smaller share of losses. Uh, the data we have seen is consistent with organized retail crime still being responsible for about 5% of total retail inventory shrink. The NRF's own numbers show external theft is responsible for less than half the industry's losses, and organized retail crime is a slice of that. And even Walgreens CFO admitted in a January earnings call that the company might have overstated the issue. You know, maybe we, we, we cried too much last year. Even analysts who think that theft is actually a risk, they may very well be using it either as an excuse for poorly merchandised stores that aren't as successful, maybe poorly staffed stores, poorly located stores. Brick and mortar stores are dealing with staffing shortages and walkouts, competition from online retailers and payouts from opioid crisis settlements. In a statement, CVS reiterated the problem of stealing, saying that incidents of theft in its stores have increased 30 percent since 2020. But many chains have doubled down on loss prevention measures that make it harder, not easier for customers to buy products. Now the products that we buy every day are not easily accessible. Something even as simple as like deodorant or hand soap, a lot of times that's behind the glass. So you have to go through a, through someone with a, with a key to open up a case. Now some customers turning to delivery services like Capsule, Amazon and Instacart to bring medicines and groceries straight to their doors. I think online definitely makes it easier. All of these measures just add friction to the process. Um, and I think there does become a certain point where it's not worth it anymore. But some say in-person shopping is worth the hassle. Just the convenience of being able to go into a store, um, it's kind of unmatched by anything else. 
While others say these anti-theft measures have led to a diminished customer experience, retail analysts are still bullish. If you look at overall sales, they're actually up both brick and mortar and on e-commerce. Brick and mortar still on a solid foundation. Christine Romans, NBC News. Now to what is making financial headlines. This morning, Google's parent company is paying up thanks to one of many antitrust cases against the company. CNBC Silvana Hanau joins us with that and some other money news. Silvana, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Savannah. Yes, so Google's parent company, Alphabet, has agreed to pay $700 million and make changes to its app store. The settlement resolves claims by a group of states that Google operates the Play App Store as an illegal monopoly, allegedly quashing competition from app distributors on Android devices. Developers will now be able to use an alternative payment system, which Google has been testing for more than a year. The settlement also requires Google to simplify the process of downloading apps directly from a developer's website without using an online store. Comcast Xfinity says it suffered a data breach in mid-October. Xfinity, which provides video, broadband, and phone service, has notified law enforcement and started an investigation. The company says the data breach was likely due to a vulnerability in software, which has been fixed. Xfinity says some customer information was likely acquired, including usernames, hash passwords, contact details, and the last four digits of social security numbers. And Amazon and the estate of J.R.R. Tolkien have won a lawsuit over the Prime Video series, The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. A little-known author and Tolkien fan filed a $250 million suit claiming Amazon stole the idea for the series from his fan fiction book, The Fellowship of the King. The judge not only threw out the case, but ordered the author to pay Amazon and the Tolkien estate's legal fees. He also prevented him from ever selling further copies of his book and destroyed all physical and digital copies. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and other works won't enter the public domain until 2044, guys. Wow, that is some drama. All right, Silvana, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. Coming up, go boldly going where no other has gone before. From landmark launches to lunar landings, we're going to look back at another big year for space exploration and what could be on the horizon for 2024. That's next. Welcome back. We're going to go global for today's Good Talker with a look at something to meow for. A farmer in Thailand has turned a rice field into a work of art. This image of a sleeping cat hugging a fish, as you can tell there from the sky, it all started with a sketch. The farmer drew a picture and mapped it out using GPS coordinates. A team then came together and planted rainbow rice seeds in various spots across the field to create the image. The picture actually represents a traditional Thai proverb about abundance. The team says it hopes their work will attract tens of thousands of tourists and, of course, cat lovers, hoping to catch a glimpse of their perfect work of art. Mm. Very cool. I guess um, good boy doesn't really work with... <laughs> He's such a good kitty. Yeah. <laughs> Thank that you. Better? <laughs> that might be our last one of this year, so I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, finally, at this hour, let's take a look back at a successful year for space exploration. Everything from Elon Musk's monster rocket making it into space to NASA bringing back its first asteroid sample. All these things made headlines. Joining us now on set, no one better than Mike Massimino, former NASA astronaut and, of course, the author of the newly released book, Moonshot and NASA, mm -hmm. NASA Astronauts Guide to Achieving the Impossible. So good. Good to Read have it. you with us. So let's, let's recap here. here. Russia, yeah. India, Japan all made landing attempts on the moon this year, something that just hadn't been in our minds for so yeah. long. What can we expect in 2024 when it comes to attempts? What are you keeping an eye on? Well, I think it's, it was a, a, a lot of moon stuff last year. India became the fourth country to land something on the moon. They've also returned the uh, propulsion modules now orbiting the Earth. They're sort of, they're, they were able to return some of that spacecraft to orbit, not back to the Earth, but to Earth orbit. So I think that's pretty, pretty exciting. And I, I think what we're looking at here is setting up 2024 to be another big moon year, really big. I think the first uh, one, for, one thing to look for early in the year is the first commercial launch to the moon. Um, hopefully wow. that will be successful, but there's many plans. So they're looking at commercial companies landing on the moon, <laughs> exploring, learning about there's a little bit of atmosphere. We don't really, we really call it that, but like an exosphere. What's in the you know, ground? Is there water and so on? Uh, there's also going to be a, a, a human mission, a crewed mission to the moon as well uh, for NASA astronauts. Hopefully by the end of the year, we'll be orbiting the moon. So that is, that's another huge, uh, another huge occurrence. So I think it's oh, going to yeah. be 
a, a lot about going to the moon, uh, learning more about it, and hopefully getting people there by the end of the year, not to land, but at least to orbit, which would be maybe next year, 2025 or so, we're looking at landing people on the moon again. So yeah. that's we're gearing up for the moon. Yeah, that NASA one, that's Artemis too, right? So yeah. we've got four astronauts headed, mm -hmm. making some history here. One of them is like, yeah. <laughs> kind of my friend, Christina Cook. Oh, yeah. uh, you first woman who's headed on a lunar mission. But yeah. tell us more about these who's headed on this mission. Yeah, so I really, I like all of these folks. They're all great people. You've got a picture there. Uh, Reed Wiseman is the, is the commander. He's the guy in the middle. And then Victor Glover's above him, another good friend of mine. Uh, Jeremy Hansen from uh, from Canada, and you said Christina's there as well. So, uh, this it's a great it's a great crew. Um, I think it's going to be very exciting. They're not landing, so it's going to be a big mission because they're going to be right. orbiting. They're going to be orbiting in such a way with these really big orbits. They're going to go further than anyone else has been mm -hmm. from the planet because they're going to go in a big orbit around the moon. So it'll be far away from our from the Earth, but they're going to do a couple uh, like figure eights between Earth and uh, and the moon. Uh, and that's going to be preparing for the landing. So this is a really cool mission. When I, I saw the crew, they were here uh, last um, when they were in the spring when they were announced, and they were very excited. And I, I think that we're going to be even more excited when we find out who's going to be landing. Mm. So yeah, we got 20 seconds here, but yeah. we should talk about SpaceX's most powerful yeah. rocket, Starship. Yeah. So they had two big tests this year. They, they exploded the rocket right. in the end, but that was kind of the point. They're, they're learning. Oh. They're, they're, yeah. They do these things. It's fail fast, learn faster is their motto, and uh, they're going to have another one coming up probably early in, uh, in early 2024 as well. We can look forward to that. Okay. But again, it's all about, I look, I look at this year kind of, it's all about going to the moon. Right. Right. The asteroid return was another, another oh, yeah. uh, big story. So I think we're looking at things beyond the Earth orbit is okay. what it is. Looking at the moon, looking at asteroids, and more of that coming in 2024. And those Hubble um, pictures were also <laughs> awesome this year. Good pictures got. coming back. We should you know, let's see what we find out there, too. Mike right. Massimino, and you'll be with us through it all next year, too. Our favorite I'll, astronaut from the show. I'm <laughs> around. Thanks, I'll be Mike. here. It's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Good morning. Thank you for joining us on this Tuesday. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, Mother Nature is wreaking some holiday havoc on millions of Americans. Heavy rains and a smattering of snow raising the risk of widespread flooding across the Northeast. It's all making for a tumultuous start to the Christmas travel rush with hundreds of delays already reported this morning. We've got your full forecast coming up. In the Middle East this morning, a new video released by Hamas that shows three elderly Israeli hostages pleading for their freedom. It comes as the humanitarian situation in Gaza grows more dire by the day. We have the very latest from the ground. Developing this morning, a devastating volcanic eruption in Iceland triggered by weeks of earthquakes. Their officials now declaring a state of emergency and ordering thousands in nearby towns to evacuate. We'll bring you what we know in a moment. And we're going to end the hour with a little bit of Christmas cheer. It is a holiday tradition in small town Nebraska that has been lighting up faces and facades for more than a century. Very cool to see that. Mm -hmm. Look forward to getting you in this spirit on this Tuesday. Let's start this morning, though, with the thing that's not putting us in the spirit, the yeah. powerful storm that pummeled the East Coast from Florida all the way up to Maine. This morning, millions of Americans are cleaning up from a day of heavy rain and flooding, gusty winds, and for some, even a big blast of snow. All that severe weather happening just as this holiday travel rush is getting started. It's causing headaches at airports across the nation. We have team coverage for you. Meteorologist Angie Lastman has the latest on what you can expect today, where this is headed. But first, NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa is at the Newark airport with a look at the storm's impact. Hey, Emily. Hey there. Well, fortunately, we're seeing some improvement from yesterday's thousands of flight disruptions now that the massive storm has moved off the East Coast. Still, officials are urging travelers to be patient and cautious when navigating the aftermath of downed trees, power lines flooding, and a hectic start to the holiday rush. This morning, millions of Americans still dealing with the impacts of a deadly winter wallop. The risk of flooding high in communities near swollen rivers across the Northeast. The region battered by torrential rain Monday that stranded drivers and left many in need of rescue. I got stranded and the police came and the fire department came. Patterson, New Jersey, underwater and a state of emergency. Officials in Vermont, where some neighborhoods had to be evacuated, now beginning to survey the damage from extensive flooding. Stay off the roads if you can. 
Whipping winds also packing a punch with gusts topping 60 miles an hour in seven states. At least two people died in storm related accidents. The December deluge snarling travel too on the roads and the runways one week out from Christmas. Floods was crazy. We had to take different routes through the city to get here. Travelers hoping Monday's 560 plus flight cancellations and more than 5,000 delays won't spill over into the rest of what's expected to be a record week for air travel. Instead of going from Charlotte, North Carolina to Florida, we're going to Dallas, Texas and then to Florida. To help avoid air travel headaches, arrive at the airport at least two hours early. If possible, avoid checking a bag in case of delays. Many flights will be full, so have a backup plan if yours is canceled. And download your airline's app ahead of time for the fastest communication. And as always, pack your patience as bad weather complicates the start of the holiday travel crush. While most of the country won't see a white Christmas, the unseasonably warm temperatures forecasted for the holiday weekend should be good news for travelers. The rush will ramp up on Thursday with tens of millions of people expected to take flight and hit the road for Christmas. Back to you. All right, Emily, thank you so much. Let's keep tracking the weather with meteorologist Angie Lastman. That's all right. Let's get your forecast. Angie, where's this headed? What's the latest? Good morning. Good morning, guys. We've got a couple of spots that we're watching. The What's left over of kind of what that system brought us over the weekend and into early this week is it that's long gone, but we do see these strong winds kind of left behind that's leaving us with uh, some lake effect snow to deal with along Lake Erie and Lake Ontario through the day today. That'll slowly start to taper off and we'll be looking like we'll be looking a lot better here as the day goes on. We've got some chilly conditions centered across parts of the southeast. We'll talk about that in a moment and these record highs for the middle of the country. But we've got a couple of storms that we're going to track moving onshore for the west coast. That means uh, California and points north could see some heavy rain. We'll see some additional snowfall across places like the sea and it could be a little bumpy for travel if you're headed out west. Meanwhile, we've got warmer than normal temperatures. No surprise there. Mid to upper 60s expected in Denver today. 53 degrees for Albuquerque. As far north as Rapid City, temperatures are into the upper 50s. These, of course, aren't temperatures that look like December, especially not in places like Minneapolis, which are, is going to end up into the low 40s through today tomorrow. Chicago, too, upper 50s for St. Louis. So you kind of get the picture. We're running warm for the middle of the country. And as we get into the late part, Parts of our, our work week and head into that holiday travel. Things, yes, are looking mild to say the least. We'll still be into the low 40s in some spots like Cleveland, but nothing like where we should be for this time of year. Mid 40s uh, as we head into Friday in Washington, D.C. and mid 50s for Raleigh through the end of the week and into the upcoming weekend. Now, and of course, it's, it's, it's such a busy travel week. So let's look ahead to Friday. This is supposed to be the busiest travel day of the holiday season. And here's what we've got going on. It's going to be mild across parts of the Midwest. We will have some rain that we track from the Midwest down to the Gulf Coast. And then that rain over the desert. If I had a guess of where we'd see some delays when it comes to um, uh, Friday travel, I would say out West, places like LA. You'll have to watch for the airport de delays there with that rain working through. As we get into Saturday, snow across the mountains out West too. And we've got some showers and thunderstorms that we'll track across parts of the South. It'll look great across the Midwest, Minneapolis, Milwaukee, into the upper 40s. And for the most part on Saturday, the East will remain dry. But here's Sunday. We're gearing up, of course, for the holiday. Lots of snow across the middle of the country, across the Rockies. Denver will deal with some snow showers. We'll see spring-like conditions, though, the farther east you go, and some rain, of course, down through the Gulf Coast once again. Maybe some difficulties when it comes to travel there. By the time we get to Christmas Day, this is for Savannah, dashing through the rain. I know she'll <laughs> like this, uh, but maybe she won't like the rain that we're going to have to deal with, guys. This is something that we'll see uh, I like through dream Christmas come true. Day. <laughs> you like that? And then a dream come true. We'll finally get a little bit of a snow for a white Christmas for folks there. It will be unseasonably mild though. I'm going to be spending the holiday in Detroit and unfortunately temperatures will be in the 50s there and a lot of folks along the East Coast will have a similar story for our Christmas holiday. So uh, not the white Christmas that I know you guys are dreaming of but you'll just have to go to the Rockies if you want that. Yeah, we yeah. just saw Dr. John do a fist pump here when you talked yeah. about snow yeah. in Colorado. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, that's where he's headed. <laughs> he's huh? happy. All right. Thank you. Thank Angie. you. Appreciate it. How do a health warning from the CDC hospitalizations from respiratory illnesses are on the rise across the country. Data released by the agency says more than 23,000 people were hospitalized with COVID-related symptoms during the first week of December. The report also found that other
other respiratory illnesses like RSV are on the rise across the country. Well, joining us now, as you just heard, is Dr. John Torres. Always great to have you with us. So, Dr. John, let's dig into some of these numbers here. According to the CDC's report, flu-related hospitalizations up by 200 percent. For RSV, that number is at 60 percent. COVID hospitalizations shot up 51 percent. Walk us through this spike. I mean, is it because of the time of year? Is it because it's cold? We're getting inside. We're seeing people. What is this? So there's a few things happening right now, and there is the seasonality of two of those viruses, flu and RSV. We know they ha they increase in the winter type season, and that's where we are right now. As far as COVID, it's an annual virus, and we know it's annual, but it has peaks, and those peaks tend to be now, right mm. now, as a matter of fact. And if you remember last year and the year before, we were talking about the triple demic, you know, having all three oh, yeah. of those viruses. Well, that's kind of where we are right now as well. And a couple things, you know, number one, we're getting together we're traveling more when you travel you see these things happen when you get together with people you see these things happen and then the seasonality so that confluence of all those factors mean that we're going to see these cases rise up more another issue could be folks not getting vaccinated because the cdc is sounding the alarm vaccination rates are low lower than this time last year for those who haven't done it yet for any of these flu rsv covid you can still get it right right joan you bring up a good point because rsv is the new vaccine that's out there and so you want to look at that as well yeah. so you have you, you should have your flu you should have your covid by now you should have your rsv by now if you don't have those you know the big question people have is it too late to get them it's never too late to get those vaccines yes it takes two weeks to take effect fully, so it's not going to be taking effect by the holidays. But every day you have it, you're protected more and more than you were the day before. So get them now. RSV, young babies can get it. This, it's not a vaccine. It's an immunization. And 60 and above can get it. It's a vaccine in that case. You know, think about that, especially if you're around others who might be sick. Remind us, give us some rules here, especially as we're headed to see people. At what point are you too sick to go do it? If you're kind of feeling a little under the weather, a little cough, something like that, when should you stay home? So the big rule, if you have a fever, stay home. Absolutely stay home, regardless of how you feel. On the other hand, if you don't have a fever, but you're coughing and sneezing, or if you do have a fever and you're coughing and sneezing, stay home as well, because you're going to start spreading it to other people. And if you just feel bad and under the weather, look at how you feel, look at who you're going to be around and say, okay, you know, do I need to stay home because I want to protect those as well and then the one thing i always carry this with me especially when you're on the airplane yeah. friday i was on an airplane there was a gentleman next to me coughing didn't cover up when he coughed the whole Ooh. flight i put this on about 10 minutes into the flight wore it <laughs> and it's you know hopefully you know knock on wood it protected me but that's what happens these days and so just carry it with you use it just temporarily and you're good to go did you it's give him dirty gnarly. looks like i do i did <laughs> give him a little bit of ice thing <laughs> i just stare yeah. at someone who's coughing and like i'm just a like covid problem that's like a manners problem i wasn't the only one <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, gosh. okay well now that we've grossed you out dr john torres thank you so much you bet <laughs> Turning now to the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas, U.S. officials are now in the region with the hopes of resuming hostage negotiations and de-escalating the violence unfolding in Gaza. But so far, a deal for hostages does not seem to be happening anytime soon. NBC News Now anchor Hallie Jackson joins us from Tel Aviv with the latest. Hallie, good morning. Hey there, Joe. Good morning to you. And just this morning, Hamas says it fired off another barrage of missiles toward Tel Aviv here, setting off sirens in this city for the first time in more than a week. Remember, this is a city that has seen protest after protest of people trying to put pressure on the Israeli government to get to some kind of a deal, some kind of a temporary ceasefire to get those hostages home. But now a national security official from the U.S. says that a deal does not appear imminent at this point, as Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is in the region, saying that's a top priority for the Biden administration and encouraging Israel to do whatever it can to protect civilians. This morning, the U.S. again encouraging Israel to work to prevent harm in Gaza with Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin in Tel Aviv. Protecting Palestinian civilians in Gaza is both a moral duty and a strategic imperative. Pressure now growing for another deal to release more hostages held captive in Gaza as the Israeli military pledges to bring home three elderly men, seen in new propaganda video released by Hamas, recorded under duress. It comes as the humanitarian crisis in the Gaza Strip is getting worse, with a grim milestone approaching. Nearly 20,000 people killed there, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. The Israelis say Hamas is using civilians there as human shields. Inside Israel, anger building after the death of three Israeli hostages killed by their own military, even after holding up a white flag. Samer Talalka, Yotam Hayim, and Alon Shamriz, whose family is sitting shiva. Avi Shamriz tells us he recognized his son's handwriting on the signs the hostages hung, calling for help. What is your message 
to the government. You murdered my son twice. You let the Hamas take my son on October 7th, and you killed my son on December, December 14th. They are not our leaders. They thinking only on themselves. At the southern Israel home of Samer Talalka, who was also killed by the IDF, his mother, Leila, greets visitors, including an Israeli politician. We can only ask for your forgiveness, he says. Quietly, angrily, she speaks, telling him, I will not forgive anyone. Because these words came late, she says. You can see the pain and the anger and the grief from these families. You can feel it. And I was so struck, Joe, by the way that they talked about their priority now is trying to get all the other hostages being held in Gaza released, even though their children, their sons will, of course, not be among them, Joe. Mm. All right. Wow. All right. Hallie Jackson, thank you so much. Appreciate your reporting. Mm. Well, former Trump White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows has lost another attempt to move his Georgia election interference case from state court to federal court. A federal appeals court upheld a judge's ruling from September rejecting Meadows' latest bid to move the case. According to the ruling, Meadows' actions were not related to his official duties while working in the Trump administration. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos for more on this. All right, so Meadows, one of 19 people, along with former President Trump, hit with felony charges here related to alleged attempts to try and keep Trump in office after losing the 2020 election. He pleaded not guilty. The judge who heard the appeal said the law, quote, does not apply to former federal officers. What else should we take away from this rule? So this was not a motion to dismiss. This is removal. In other words, it's like a castle move in chess. If you're a defendant and you're in state court and you don't want to be in state court, sometimes you can remove the case unilaterally without the plaintiff or the prosecution wanting you there up to federal court. It happens 99% of the time in civil cases. Federal criminal removal is very, very rare. It doesn't happen very often. This is one of those potential instances. And uh, the defendant here tried to get it up to federal court, and the appeals court essentially said, looking at the removal statute, there are two reasons why uh, the defendant failed here. Looking at the removal statute first, you have to presently be an officer. Mm. And the support for that is you look at another section of the statute and, and it says, in other cases, uh, as long as you were an officer at some point in the past, in a prior life, whenever, but in this particular statute, it says whoever is an officer, it uses the present tense, uh, the defendant is no longer an officer. He is a private citizen. He cannot avail himself of the benefit of that statute. And then secondly, as you said, the second reason, which would have been independent anyway, was that he was not acting as a federal officer. He was acting on behalf of a campaign. So two independent reasons why mm. this case does not stay in federal court. It goes back to state court, which really at the end of the day was a strategic advantage only. It wouldn't have ended the prosecution. Remind us why it is that he does not want this going down in Georgia. Uh, because again, it's it's really just a tactical thing, and I've removed plenty of cases. It really is a way of taking, and I think it would have been really effective in this case. You take the prosecution out of their home base. Think about it. In state court, the prosecutor's office, I believe, in Fulton County, is either across the street or in the same building. That's pretty par mm -hmm. for the course. Most prosecutors have their offices in the same building. They know the judges. They know the halls of the courtroom. They know the procedure. If he had been successful in taking those prosecutors out of the courthouse that they know and into federal court right. with its own rules of procedure, different judges, even something as simple as having to take a cab a couple blocks, that is a significant strategic advantage. Would it have won the case? Not sure, but you take every advantage you can get uh, in this game of litigation. So Meadows faces two counts. One's a violation of Georgia's RICO Act, the other solicitation of violation by oath by a public officer. Where does this go from here? Is it looking like things could be on time as far as trial, or are we going to expect a lot of delays? Everybody asks me to mm -hmm. forecast how long all of these criminal cases will take. The rule of thumb is, it seems in Georgia, where I do not practice, but from uh, looking at reports about Fulton County cases, th that is going to be the slowest case of all of the Trump cases. Number one, it's in state court. State court always moves more slowly than federal court. Federal court has a less crowded docket, and they have an imperative they have a mission to move cases along. They've got the Speedy Trial Act. Cases move faster in federal court. In state court, they move slower. And just to give you an example, and I've used this example ad nauseum, the, uh, the last major RICO case in this county had jury selection for eight months. Mm -hmm. Just to give you an idea. So right, I've wow. been saying, and save the tape, 
but don't really save the tape. <laughs> I've been saying that the first witness in the Fulton County case will not be called until 2025. Not 24, 2025. That I'm allowing for a long jury selection period. First witness, 2025. You heard it here. Far more likely we're going to see some of the other Trump cases. Absolutely. First. All right. Absolutely. Thank we'll you remind so much you as always. If Please don't. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. Now to new developments in the battle over immigration. Police officers in Texas could soon begin arresting migrants who enter the state illegally. That's because of a new law that was just signed by Governor Greg Abbott that could set up a clash with the Biden administration. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joins us now from Dallas with the latest here. Hey, Morgan, good morning. So tell us about this new law and what it is that makes it so controversial. Yes, yeah, Savina, good morning. The change here is that it is already against federal law to cross illegally. This makes it breaking the state law if you cross anywhere except these specific legal ports of entry. In addition to that, Savannah, it empowers judges with the ability to expel migrants back to their countries of origin. And, of course, it gives state authorities, police, sheriff's deputies, and state troopers the ability to arrest migrants on these state charges. Now, overnight, the White House is already calling this law extreme and says it will make Texas communities less safe. They are stressing the fact that immigration is the federal government's responsibility, but Texas Governor Greg Abbott has said time and time again, including just yesterday, that due to the recent influx of migrants and lax border policies by the Biden administration, he has had no choice but to take these matters into his own hands, essentially, uh, signing this bill into law that would theoretically go into effect in March. Savannah? Morgan, our viewers know if they've been with us this morning because we've been talking a lot about this. There's this bipartisan group in Washington that's already working on reforming U.S. border policy. It's part of a bigger thing that's even tied to funding for Israel and Ukraine, something they're trying to smash and get done before the end of the year. We'll see what happens. But how does this fit into those ongoing discussions, something like this, a border policy here within the state? It'll be interesting to follow, Savannah. We do know that nothing firm has come out of those bipartisan discussions. We anticipate legal pushback, potentially from multiple fronts here. We've heard from civil rights groups that are calling this state law unconstitutional. They have threatened to sue. We know that a group of congressional Democrats are already speaking with the Justice Department, urging them to take action. And we could very well see uh, another showdown between the federal government and the state of Texas, similar to what we've seen in the last several weeks, where a judge ruled against Texas Governor Greg Abbott's border buoy, that thousand foot long buoy that was in the middle of the Rio Grande to deter migrants. That was ruled against. We do know that Governor Greg Abbott is confident that this law will stand. I should note that legal experts say that the very aspect of this law could prompt a revisiting of a 2012 Arizona immigration law pitting the state against the federal government. In that case, Savannah, the Supreme Court sided with the federal government. It remains to, this, to be seen if this will rise to that level. Uh, but again, it does go into effect in March. Savannah. All right. Morgan Chesky, thank you very much. We've got more to come on this hour of Morning News Now. After the break, new questions this morning swirling around the health of pop icon Celine Dion, what her sister is now saying about her condition. Plus, stunning new visuals this morning of that volcanic eruption that's rocking Iceland, what local officials are now saying about its risk to the public. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. A volcano in Iceland's most populated region erupted on Monday, shooting lava into the air and lighting up the sky for miles. It comes after weeks of earthquakes that led to mandatory evacuations last month, even the shutdown of the iconic Blue Lagoon. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter has the latest developments here on this. Hey, Molly, good morning. Savannah, good morning. The pictures are just unbelievable. Now, the good news is that officials in Iceland say it is not currently life-threatening, but they believe it may last anywhere between a week and 10 days. And really, once molten lava starts moving, starts running, it can become impossible to stop. Take a look. This morning, stunning aerial images from southwestern Iceland capturing a late night eruption, spewing searing hot lava from volcanic fissures. It comes after weeks of anticipation and earth shaking seismic activity. Icelandic officials say the eruptions brought on by a swarm of earthquakes Monday night, beginning northeast of Grindavik, a fishing village where a state of emergency was declared last month. 
the entire population of 4,000 people evacuated as a precaution. It's the fourth volcanic eruption in two years and the largest so far, with an initial fissure opening spanning three miles and lava shooting over some 300 feet into the air. It's just fascinating to see just nature in action. I just, it's just like something from a movie. The Icelandic Coast Guard surveying the area overnight in an effort to confirm the eruption's exact size and location. Passengers at one of Iceland's main airports, just 16 miles away, reacting. As soon as we know anything, we will let you know. Authorities have raised the country's aviation alert level because volcanic ash can pose a risk to engines on passenger planes, something that happened when another volcano erupted in Iceland back in 2010, creating an ash cloud that grounded air travel in Europe for more than a week. Monday's eruptions follows weeks of intense seismic activity that spurred thousands of earthquakes, prompting the closure of the country's iconic Blue Lagoon. Now, officials are stressing vigilance and caution as the region waits on Mother Nature to run its course. Now, Savannah, eruptions are unpredictable. That is the big picture. But Icelandic officials say those lava fountains overnight were hundreds of feet now down to just about 100 feet tall. The other really good piece of news this morning is that airport officials say there is no disruption in flight schedules. Mm. And that, of course, means that across Europe, there's also no disruption at this time. Of course, we're watching closely. That could change. Savannah? Absolutely. You said it, Molly. Just incredible images. Thank you so much. Now there's some other headlines from around the world. A deadly earthquake hit northwestern China overnight. NBC News foreign correspondent Ali Aruzi joins us on that now. Hey, Ali, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. Good morning, Joe. That's right. At least 126 people have been killed in northwest China in the country's most fatal earthquake in over a decade. The 6.2 magnitude earthquake struck the mountainous Kansu province, shaking it to its core, splitting entire villages. Chinese President Xi Jinping has ordered thousands of rescue crews to the region, which is amongst the poorest in China. Over to the Vatican City, where a landmark ruling approved by Pope Francis will allow Roman Catholic priests to administer blessings to same-sex couples as long as they're not part of the regular church rituals. However, the new ruling will almost certainly be opposed by conservatives who critique the Pope after his initial comments on the subject in October. And finally, over a quarter of a century after the death of Princess Diana, people are still fascinated with her, all too evident from the latest sale of one of her dresses in a Los Angeles auction going under the hammer for a record price of almost $1,150,000, 11 times over the estimated price, smashing the previous record of over $600,000 for one of her dresses. You'd probably have a nervous breakdown sending that dress to the dry cleaners. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. I think that's not going to happen yet. I'm not sure it's for wearing as much as looking at. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. We do have an update this morning on the health of pop icon Celine Dion. If you remember last year, she revealed she was diagnosed with a condition that impacts her ability to move. Now her sister is speaking out with an update. That's right. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Gosk is following this for us. She joins us now. Hey, Steph, good morning. Hey guys, good morning. You know, Celine Dion announced last May she was battling a rare neurological disorder that made it impossible to continue her tour. Her fans were optimistic she may return to performances after an appearance in October when she was looking very healthy. But now her sister says the award-winning singer is struggling to overcome the debilitating disease. This morning, new questions about Celine Dion's health. Power ballad superstar has been battling a rare neurological disorder called stiff person syndrome. Dion's older sister Claudette now telling a Canadian news outlet that the condition is getting worse and that her sister works hard but she doesn't have control of her muscles. Adding the disease is so rare that some have lost hope but that the family has received an outpouring of love. The 55 year old Grammy Award winner last appeared smiling at a hockey game in October with her sons Renee Charles and 13-year-old twins, Nelson and Eddie. I've been dealing with problems with my health for a long time. In May, Dion canceled her world tour. And it's been really difficult for me to face these challenges and to talk about everything that I've been going through. 
Stiff person syndrome affects one or two in a million people and causes painful muscle spasms and stiffness. Where the body's own immune system starts attacking the nerves and particularly starts attacking a part of the nerves that shuts off muscles when they start tightening up. Despite her private battle, Dion and her many fans, hoping that one day she can still return to the stage. All I know is singing. It's what I've done all my life. And it's what I love to do the most. People are certainly hoping she can do it again. Because this disease is so rare, there is little research that has been done. But Dion's sister says she is fighting hard, bringing the same kind of discipline and dedication to her health, you guys, as she brings to her music career. Wow. Oh, all right. Thank you for that update, yeah. Steph. Heartbreak well, Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Coming up, actor Jonathan Major is now reportedly dropped by Marvel Studios. Yeah, the guilty verdict that's now putting Major's once flourishing career in jeopardy. That is next. Welcome back. A judge in Idaho has denied attempts to dismiss the charges against Brian Koberger. He's the man accused of stabbing four college students to death at the University of Idaho last year. Koberger was pleaded not guilty to the murder charges. A trial date has still not been set. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett has the latest. Hey there, this case has been full of delays and detours, but now with this latest decision from the judge finally in, the victim's families want to see this case go to trial. This morning, the case against Brian Koberger inching closer to trial. The judge overseeing the case denying attempts by Koberger's legal team to get the criminal charges against him thrown out. The judge finding his lawyers failed to challenge the indictment on grounds of juror bias, lack of sufficient evidence, or prosecutorial misconduct, adding Koberger was indicted by an impartial grand jury. This argument really does is fighting against some case law. The judge also rejecting a second defense motion that claimed prosecutors wrongly used a lower standard of proof when instructing the grand jury, calling the arguments, quote, interesting and creative, but ultimately unpersuasive. It's been more than a year since prosecutors allege Koberger entered this off-campus house and fatally stabbed four college students from the University of Idaho, Zana Kernodal, Ethan Chapin, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Gonzalez. Authorities say they found Koberger's DNA on a knife case recovered from one of the victim's beds. The actual murder weapon never found. The state has said it's seeking the death penalty. A judge entered a not guilty plea on Koberger's behalf in May. The delay in getting this case to trial, not unusual. But a lawyer for the families says it's taking an emotional toll. It's tormenting. You know, you want to have at least a trial date set uh, for the family because it's a time and a date where you can kind of try to move past this kind of monkey that's just sitting out there on your back. The judge's ruling comes after the university announced last week it would soon demolish the house where the murders took place. The families of the victims worry that would be premature before trial. The whole family surprised not only that they're going to be demoing the house but also the fact that it's only it's happening within two weeks. You know, three days after Christmas. As for what happens next, the prosecutors were set to turn over some of the DNA evidence for the judge's review earlier this month. He should decide what, if anything, goes to the defense team very soon. Back to you. All right, Laura Jerry, thank you so much. Well, now to the swift fall of one of Hollywood's fastest rising stars. Jonathan Majors was found guilty on Monday of assaulting his ex-girlfriend. The actor was set to star in an upcoming Marvel film, but according to a source with direct knowledge of the matter, he was dropped by the studio shortly after the verdict. NBC News entertainment correspondent Chloe Malas was in the courtroom for some of the trials here to break down the verdict and the consequences. Chloe, good morning. Good morning, Joe. The New York City jury handed down a mixed verdict after deliberating for about five hours. Majors was found guilty on two counts of assault and harassment, but cleared on the other two charges. Now, this all surrounds an incident in March involving his then girlfriend, Grace Jabari, whom he met on the set of a Marvel movie in 2021. Jonathan, how are you feeling today? This morning, actor Jonathan Majors, best known for his roles in Creed 3 in Marvel movies, I paved the road. Found guilty of assault and hours later fired from the Marvel Universe. A source with direct knowledge of the decision told NBC News. 
A jury on Monday afternoon convicting him on two out of four charges, assault in the third degree, a misdemeanor, and a harassment violation, stemming from an incident earlier this year involving his ex-girlfriend, Grace Jabari. During the nearly two-week trial, the actor's ex-girlfriend took the stand for several days, testifying that the actor assaulted her for grabbing his phone after she spotted a text from another woman, causing a laceration behind her ear and a fractured finger. Street surveillance footage played in court from the night in question showed Jabari getting out of an SUV and Majors picking her up and putting her back into the car. Prosecutors claimed that the actor threw her back inside the vehicle like a football, but Majors' attorney said that she was the one who assaulted him, even chasing him down the street. When the jury first began to deliberate last week, they asked the judge to replay a 911 call Majors made the morning after the assault. Is she unconscious? Majors telling 911 he had found an unresponsive Jabari in his apartment. Police arresting the actor after observing injuries to Jabari's head and neck. Majors, who did not take the stand, has maintained his innocence and faces up to one year in jail. After the verdict, his attorney saying in a statement, Mr. Majors still has faith in the process and looks forward to fully clearing his name. Now with Majors awaiting sentencing on February 6th, the movie studios that propelled him to stardom, wasting no time cutting ties. Now, many are speculating that text messages revealed late in the trial solidified Majors' fate. The text between the former couple discuss another incident where Majors appears to try and talk Jabari out of going to the hospital for a head injury. Jabari writing in one of those text messages, I'll just tell the doctor I bumped my head. Why would I want to tell them what really happened when it's clear I want to be with you? And now he's no longer going to helm those upcoming Marvel movies, so it'll be... Interesting to see if other film studios do hire him because remember he was Hollywood's one of the fastest rising stars with a very promising career. Mm. All right, Chloe, thank you so much. Coming up, if you are looking to snag a new Apple Watch in time for Christmas, you might be out of luck. Yeah, why the company is set to freeze sales of some of its best sellers in holiday shopping's 11th hour. That's next on Morning News Now. We are back now with new developments in the investigation into lead-tainted applesauce that sickened dozens of children. Well, after the FDA claimed the poisonings may have been intentional, the agency now says they may know where the lead came from. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Gosk has the details. Three wannabana made applesauce pouches, easy snacks for parents with small children, were recalled this fall because of lead contamination. The FDA says it knows where the lead came from. Cinnamon supplied by the company Negasmart in Ecuador. Samples showing extremely high levels of lead contamination. The FDA suspects the supplier may have been motivated by money, possibly using dyes that contain lead or adding lead to make the cinnamon heavier. Some advocacy groups calling for more to be done to ensure food safety. How do we keep this from happening in the future? This never should have happened. We should have a system of protections in place at the federal level that require companies to test for lead and other contaminants. At least 65 parents tell the FDA their children have elevated lead exposure from the applesauce. According to incident reports obtained by NBC News, parents described symptoms possibly related to the lead, including gastrointestinal issues and anemia. The FDA says it has not yet verified all of the reports. Long-term lead exposure can damage the brain and nervous system, according to the CDC. The Callahans say they regularly gave their one-year-old the since-recalled applesauce. Since he's been diagnosed with lead poisoning, uh, we've found out that Rudy has a little bit of a speech delay. Wanabana and the manufacturer Astrofood announced they will reimburse up to $150 in health care costs. And they are working closely with the FDA during the voluntary recall. The applesauce lead mystery is closer to being solved while raising larger concerns about food safety. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. Let's get to some financial headlines. Tesla is set to bump up pay for some of its gigafactory workers next year. CNBC's Savannah Hanau joins us once again with more on that and some other money news. Hey, Savannah, good morning. 
Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Good morning. Yeah, so Tesla will give most hourly workers at its Gigafactory in Nevada a 10% raise starting in January. That's according to documents seen by CNBC. Now, most workers' pay will rise from $20 to $22 an hour. That's at the low end. And from about $30 to $34 at the high end. Now, Tesla hasn't commented, but the raises may be part of an effort to reduce union support. Last month, the UAW said it was launching a push to unionize workers at Tesla and several other automakers. Tesla and CEO Elon Musk has staunchly opposed union efforts. A trade group representing TikTok, Meta and other tech companies is suing the state of Utah over laws requiring children and teens to get permission from their parents to use social media apps. Utah's governor signed two measures in March restricting minors from using social media between the hours of 10.30 p.m. and 6.30 a.m. Now, they also require age verification to open and maintain an account in the state. The laws, which take effect this coming March, are aimed at protecting kids from targeted ads and addictive features that could harm their mental health. The trade group says the laws are unconstitutional because they restrict access to public content. TomTom Tom and Microsoft are teaming up to bring generative AI features to the infotainment screen in your car. TomTom, Tom, which is best known for its GPS devices, says the technology will allow users to have a natural conversation to navigate, find stops along a route, control the onboard systems, open windows, and just about anything else you might do while driving. So the voice assistant will be integrated into systems offered by several major automakers, although TomTom Tom hasn't announced which ones just yet. All right. Very cool. I, I still think of, <laughs> when I hear TomTom, Tom, I think of my old GPS that I had in my car exactly. that I'd pull yes. out and like, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and you gotta like put on the, the windshield. Yep. Exactly. All right. Thanks so much. Thank it. you. If you're still working on crossing off your Christmas list, you may Definitely. be out of luck, at least in one area. We are procrastinators. Makers of some of the most popular goods, like Apple's newest smartwatches, they say their products won't be available for sale or delivery in time for the holiday. Really good news. NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans explains why. Hey there, we're talking about red hot products like Apple Watches and apparel from brands like North Face and Vans. Those clothing companies hit by a cyber attack that'll say impact delivery times if you ordered your items online. And Apple halting sales of some smartwatches later this week due to a new import ban, meaning if you want to get a new one before the holidays, you better act fast. With Christmas less than a week away, the race is on to snag those last holiday gifts. But trying to get some popular items this week may leave you singing Bah Humbug. Apple announcing it's halting sales of some of its best-selling Apple Watches, like the Series 9 and Ultra 2. Online sales will stop beginning Thursday, and in-store sales will cease starting Christmas Day. The company says it's doing this to comply with a U.S. import ban on some Apple Watches, issued by the U.S. International Trade Commission. In October, the ITC ruled that Apple had violated a patent from one of its competitors, Massimo, regarding a blood oxygen sensor it uses on several models. You can measure your blood oxygen right from your wrist. They took our technology, so it's not just a patent infringement, it's also a trade secret theft. The Biden administration has until Christmas Day to overturn the ruling, which doesn't impact sales of older models like the Apple Watch SE. The iconic accessory critical to the company's bottom line. Since its release in 2015, nearly a quarter billion have been sold. Apple shares falling on Monday, the company vowing to fight back, saying in a statement, Apple strongly disagrees with the order and is pursuing a range of legal and technical options to ensure that Apple Watch is available to customers. It's smartwatches among several hot items at risk of not making it under your Christmas tree. The parent company of apparel brands North Face, Vans, Timberland and Dickies announcing Monday its ability to fulfill online orders is currently impacted due to a cyber attack on its computer network. Alternatively, it says customers can buy merchandise at one of its brick and mortar stores. Some consumers cashing in on potential shortages of these popular brands. One Apple Watch owner posting he plans to sell his $800 Ultra 2 for $2,500, saying, I know what I got. But some experts believe Apple's decision to pause smartwatch sales right before Christmas is actually a ploy to boost holiday revenue. This is a great flash sale. Hey, get your Apple Watches while they're still there. This affects the two higher-end models of the Apple Watch, and those are the ones they make the most money on. 
Apple is reportedly working on a software fix for its Apple Watches. That would address the patent issue. If you already own an Apple Watch with a blood oxygen sensor, you are not affected by this ban. Apple says Massimo, the competitor who filed the patent complaint, recently came out with its own smartwatch, and Apple claims it's a knockoff of the Apple Watch. Apple filed two lawsuits against them last year, alleging patent violations. Back to you. Oh, all right. Well, Christine, thank you so much. With Christmas now six days away, no doubt you are scrambling to get a lot of different things done. And while that can create plenty of stress, there are ways to handle it. Dashiell Mensel from our affiliate WEAU in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, shows us how. The holidays can be known as the most wonderful time of the year, but with everything that goes into preparing for it, it can also be the most stressful time of the year. I think one of the big stressors for people is that we have this expectation that the holidays have to be the perfect holidays, right? So that leads up for unreasonable expectations, and so sometimes that's just really hard to hit. Um, another thing could be finances, family, um, so there's a lot of things that people are dealing with and trying to juggle and balance everything during the holidays. Gunderson Wellness Education Specialist Christy Harris says setting up boundaries with family can help reduce stress. I always tell people, remember the reason for the season, right, which is supposed to be time with family, time with friends. Um, but sometimes that can create a stressor, especially when family is our family. We don't always pick and choose our family, right? Amber Sherman is one of many who has to go through a lot on the holidays as her and her husband's families are not nearby each other. We're both from Iowa, but different sides of the state. Um, and so there's always this, like, do we do a big tour across the state or do we split it up? That kind of thing. So I think that, that um, that's something that we're figuring out every year. Usually we start about, I don't know, Labor Day <laughs> to figure out, like, what are we going to do for the holidays this year? Sherman has two children, and she says the holidays are never easy for most parents. I think that there's always this sense of, I want to get the big splashy gift so I get the big reaction. We actually kind of went through that this week about, like, you know, do we want to do the big splashy thing or, you know, do we want to kind of keep things a little bit more simple for our family and more work on creating the memories? And that's kind of where we landed. Experts at Gunderson Health encourage those who are struggling with holiday stress to speak out about it. And if your job has one, talk with your employee assistant program. Our thanks to Dashiell Mensel for that story. The American Psychological Association says about 41% of people say their stress actually increases during the holiday season compared to other points in the year. I believe that it. seems low. Yeah, <laughs> I don't exactly. think it'd be even higher. Yeah, yeah, I know. We were just talking this morning about how much we have to get done. Coming up, it's a century old holiday tradition that sent her own Harry Smith to a small town in Nebraska. That's where you'll find a courthouse. Yes, a courthouse that has been lighting up faces since 1922. Harry brings us the story after this. Welcome back. The Christmas Queen is back on her throne. That's right. Mariah Carey's All I Want For You Is Christmas has returned to the number one spot on the Billboard Hot 100. Carey originally released her annual smash hit nearly 25 years ago, and it's still breaking records. This is the fifth year in a row the holiday classic has reached the number one spot, which is a music first, actually. And Carey is keeping that spot warm because it's the 13th time the song has hit number one since it dropped. Truly the gift that keeps on giving. Break out your Santa hats and your hairbrush microphones because sing it with Joe. Well, first of all, I think you just said all I want for you is Christmas, which yeah. actually would be a great song. All I want for you is, is Christmas. Christmas. Like so I want you, you to have to tune, Christmas. Joe. I can't say. <laughs> I will say though, but we're gonna remember make that though, the song other now. part of the other part of the story that was cool though is that when she wasn't on it, Brenda Lee was finally right, number one. Exactly. Which yeah. was also so cool. It's cool. But we're all also happy from yeah. yeah. All right. We're gonna end this hour <laughs> with a look at the Christmas tradition that has been going on for more than a century. Since 1922, the town of Minden, Nebraska has adorned its courthouse with Christmas lights. NBC News correspondent Harry Smith has the story behind this holiday tradition. Like a postcard from Nebraska, the beautiful Christmas lights adorning the courthouse in Minden. There have been lights on the courthouse since 1922, in other words, 101 years. That's something. Jack Holtquist learned to love history from Lucille Cole, his teacher in eighth grade here. And that's a glass negative. Two men oh. actually up here working on the courthouse lights. Wow, isn't that something? Yeah. After World War II, the high school drama teacher was approached. The Chamber of Commerce came over to Clayt. Clayt would be Clayton Morey, 
Ben Morey's dad. And said, Clay, you know, could, do you have anything new we can do when we turn on the lights? The light of the world. And every year since 1946, give or take an energy crisis or pandemic, Minden has hosted the Light of the World pageant. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced. Well, my dad, he would have been so thrilled. Ben's dad directed it for years, then Ted Grease, then Ben, and now Ben's son. What is it like for you when you come to the square here? and all the Christmas lights are on. Well, it's fabulous. Uh, it puts you in the mood. Incredible lights. Indeed they are. Here in Minden, we try to strive to not have Christmas be so commercialized. Sally Jurgensmeyer has Minden roots that go back four generations. It's more about tradition and nostalgia and families making memories. And you can drive around this city square as many times as you want. Her friend Melanie Beeler moved here just a few years ago, in part because of the lights. It was something that I wanted to be a part of. It's just so great. Yeah. It's just so great. Not so fancy, these lights, but just fine for more than 100 years. Harry Smith, NBC News, Minden, Nebraska. Beautiful images and a beautiful story to go uh, with. There. Absolutely, 101 years. It's wow. amazing. Incredible. Merry Let's Christmas, everybody. This hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.